Now, today's presentation is titled, A Beautiful, Believable Plan. And as soon as you talk about a plan, there is the assumption intrinsic within the idea of I have a plan is the idea that there is some situation, some vicissitude, some adversity that needs addressing and overcoming, right? I have a plan. I'm putting on weight. I have a plan, right? I'm, I'm getting older. I have a plan. I don't have as much money as I wish I had. I have a plan. So when we talk about a beautiful, believable plan, implicit within that is the idea that, that, that God is doing something, right? That there's an actionable plan, that, that God is overcoming some kind of a situation. Now often, and this is what we're going to spend time on today, when we think about the plan, we think about the plan in a very limited sense and in a very uh, perspect, uh, subjective sense, our own perspectivism, and we say, the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation. I want to address myself to that today. We're going to take a look at the so-called plan of salvation. Not that I have any aversion to that language particularly. But we're going to look at the plan of salvation not from, insofar as it's possible, our own perspective. But from a bigger, broader, and more biblical perspective. And so we're going to address ourselves to these questions. Creation, yes. Conflict, yes. And covenant. But today, especially to conflict. And next week, a little bit more to covenant. Now, the moment that you start talking about God being in conflict, I don't know if you start to feel this way, but, but it, it makes me feel a little uneasy, philosophically speaking, and just common sense. It, it sort of, we, we could ask this question, how can there be any real and meaningful conflict between God and his creation? I mean, an actual conflict, are we talking about this? How can God, if he's all-powerful, if he's omnipotent, that's the second one here, if God is all-powerful, if he possesses all the resources of omnipotence, isn't the idea of him being in conflict with someone incoherent? Right? The idea of conflict assumes that there, that there is a strength. And, and if I'm going to be in conflict with someone, they, they are a match for my strength. They are a match. I'm pushing and they're pushing. Right? I'm, re, I'm trying to do something and they're resisting. Or, or they want to do something to me and I'm resisting. But how can we talk about an all-powerful, limitless, omnipotent God being in any kind of meaningful conflict. Now, there are religious systems that have historically affirmed a kind of dualism, a duality, that yin and yang, good and evil, are in an unending state of conflict. And there's sort of this oscillation between good and evil back and forth. And in this view of things, good and evil are eternal eternally coexistent and this this idea of dualism is that evil is resisting the good and the good res is resisting the evil and that we find ourselves some sort of balance in the middle the bible does not present this the bible presents a real god a personable god a creative god who finds himself as strange as this might seem in conflict with someone but that someone is a created being that someone is a creature which raises the question how is it coherent how is it meaningful? How can an all-powerful God be resisted? How can an all-powerful God be in conflict with anything? How can conflict be a major motif of Scripture? Well, in order to do this, in order to sort of understand that, we're going to just have to spend a few minutes unpacking what some have called the master equation. The master equation. And uh, you have it here on the screen, and we're going to spend just a moment on this. I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of it, then a really lovely C.S. Lewis quote, quote, just to get us heading in the right direction of how it would be possible or conceivable for an omnipotent being to be resisted by a created being. So what you have here on the screen is the love, freedom, risk, growth, master equation. I've spoken about it all over the world. I've spoken about it in this very church. So probably this is not new to you, but if it is, it's absolute paradigm changing, absolute game changing. And basically, it's just a picture that emerges from a series of necessary statements, necessary realities. And it begins, number one, with this basic idea that love requires freedom. The idea of love, love is voluntarily given. Love is given by choice. You cannot be coerced or first forced into love. So love requires, by, by virtue of its basic necessity, requires freedom. Okay? But then there's a second thing that follows from that. Love requires freedom, but the moment we grant freedom, number two, freedom involves, what's the word up there? Freedom involves risk. So part of giving someone freedom, whether it's the keys to the car or whether it's giving them a large amount of money or granting someone freedom, implicit within freedom is the idea that you're taking a risk. 
Freedom is risky, but then now watch what happens. The moment that you are given some modicum of freedom, whether it's, uh, again, the keys to the car or a large amount of money, or you're given freedom to maybe go on a trip apart from your spouse, freedom comes in lots of different ways. Freedom to eat what you want to eat, to spend your money how you want to spend. Here's what happens. Now you are faced with choices of real moral consequence. And you are faced, you can make good moral choices or you can make bad moral choices. And the onus, the responsibility is on you to make a good moral choice, the superior choice, the morally superior choice. And we call that responsibility. And every parent in here knows about this, right? We talk to our children about responsibility. And what we're basically saying is, look, you are presented, life presents you with options. Life presents you with choices. And you can use your freedom, your God-given freedom to make good choices or bad choices. If we don't give our teenagers or ourselves the opportunity, if God didn't give us the opportunity to make real choices with moral significance, then we could never, number four, grow. Because responsibility is the very thing. It's the matrix in which moral growth takes place. If you give someone a moral choice, a, an option to choose the inferior or the superior, whatever the thing might be, and they, they make the right choice, they grew morally. Now, if they make the wrong choice, they might not have grown then, but if they later come to learn that they had made the wrong choice, we can grow only as we are given actual freedom to make actual decisions of moral consequence. And so each of these follows one from the other, and that's why it's sometimes called the master equation. Love requires freedom. Freedom involves risk. Risk entails responsibility, and it's that very moral responsibility that enables growth. Now, this idea is well captured in the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, classic by C.S. Lewis. And I want to give you this quotation. It's a, it's a little lengthy, but I want you to bear with the strength of the quotation. Lewis says, God created things which had, what are the next two words? Free will. Free will. That means creatures which can go wrong or right. Some people think they can imagine a creature which was free but had no possibility of going wrong. Lewis says, I can't. And if you, any, if you know anything about C.S. Lewis, he had a vivid, wild imagination. He says, some people can imagine a creature that's totally free but can't do wrong. And Lewis says, I can't imagine that. I can't understand how that would be possible. He continues. If a thing is free to be good, it's also free to be what? Free to be bad. And if free will is what has made, and free will, excuse me, is what has made evil possible, which then raises the question. Why then did God give them, creatures such as you and I, free will? And he answers, because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, of creatures that worked like machines, would hardly be worth creating. The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely voluntarily united to him. And for that reason, they've got to be free. Now, of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. In the same way that when you hand your teenage child the car keys for the first time, you know what could happen. You know there is a risk. And God knew that there was risk inherent in the freedom that was given because it was genuine freedom. Apparently, says Lewis, he thought it worth the risk. If God thinks this state of war in the universe is a price worth paying for free will, that is for making a real world in which creatures can do real good or real harm, and something of real importance can actually happen. Instead of a toy world which only moves when he pulls the strings, then we may take it as worth paying. If God thought it was worth paying the price, if this is the cost, if this is the price in order to get this kind of a world, God said, that's a price I'm willing to pay. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, whoa, 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 I think the price is too high. I think the price is too high, but let me just invite you to reconsider your idea that the price is too high, the price for freedom is too high. All of those of you that had children here took a risk, right? You, you chose to have children. Now, you had a picture in your mind of how perfect that little child was going to be and that little girl. You did not imagine a heroin addict. You didn't imagine a gangbanger. You didn't imagine a prostitute. That's not what you saw. No, you saw in your mind's eye, that happens to other people's children. That's not going to happen to your children, but you knew. Even if you raised them in a good home and did everything as best as you could and you brought them up and you trained them, you knew that you were taking at some level a risk that they could run totally contrary to you, to your character, to the values of your family. You took a risk. Those of you that had children, you entered into a very similar and analogous proposition to the situation that God entered into where he gave actual, real, genuine, self-determining freedom knowing that the outcome could be negative. 
Now, in your case, you only thought the outcome could be negative. In God's case, he knew that that freedom that was given would be abused. Now, this helps us to understand how can a creature resist an omnipotent God? Because the resistance is not a resistance of strength or of power or of might. This is not a boxing match. It's not a pugilistic affair where, where God is saying, man, I think I've trained really hard and I think I can take out my enemy. No, God could destroy any creature. God could think any creature into or out of existence immediately. So this is not a conflict. It's not a, it's not a war that's being waged in the, in the venue or the forum of physical strength or physical hostility. The conflict found in Scripture is not one of might or of strength, but of, what are those next two words? Of thoughts and ideas. Go with me on this journey. Go with me on this journey. This is not about God's power or might. The conflict spoken of in Scripture is about God's character and about His moral governance. Because when freedom was given, that freedom was, was, can be used to think godly thoughts, to think thoughts that are in keeping with the principles of the kingdom of heaven, or to think thoughts contrary to God, contrary to His moral governance, and contrary to His character. This was real freedom that was genuinely given. Now, I mentioned at the outset there that we often think about the plan, like the plan of salvation, as primarily revolving and orbiting around us, right? And this is probably one of the, the dangers of, of uh, not dangers, that's probably the wrong word. This is, this is one of the factors in, in much of Christianity, right? The, the, the bottom line is basically this, how do I get to heaven, right? We're like the rich young ruler. We walk up to Jesus, good master, what do, what do I have to do that I can inherit eternal life? And we find out whatever the formula is, you have to say the sinner's prayer or you have to do X, Y, Z, you have to put your faith in Jesus, whatever the thing is, and we say, okay, I'll do it. And we've done it, and then now we think, okay, that's it. The plan has reached its end. The plan of salvation has been efficacious in my experience. That's it. That's the beginning and the effective end of the story. I'm gonna suggest here today that the plan of salvation is actually, what you and I think of as the plan of salvation is actually just a part of a much larger whole. Your personal salvation, your personal eternal life, the, the, the life that you've been gifted both in the here and now and in the hereafter is actually a part of a larger whole that's playing out on a cosmic scale, on a universal scale. And because of our perspective as creatures, as people who's, who struggle with guilt and shame and unforgiveness and all the things that we wrestle with, we have a tendency to see rather myopically and narrowly that most of what's happening in reality revolves around us, including the very throne of God. Right? This is all about my salvation. It's about me. And there is a sense in which it certainly is about that. But I want to try and draw our minds to a bigger, broader, and more cosmic perspective here today. Right? This is a beautiful, believable plan. What is the plan that God enacted? We are all captives to our own perspective. That is, we see things from where we see them. Everybody. You can't, you cannot, you can Insofar as it's possible, you can try and see something from somebody else's perspective. But even then, you are seeing things through your eyes. You are hearing things through your ears. You are smelling things through your nose and tasting things through your mouth. We are captives to our own perspective. Even our perceived or supposed objectivity is bathed in subjectivity. This has been the major contribution of postmodernism. And postmodernism has gone too far in the history of ideas. There's no question about that. Suggesting that there are no absolutes because everything is subjective, everything is relative. What is true is that even our supposed objectivity is bathed in subjectivity. What is not true is that that means that there is no objective truth, not true. But what we can say for certainty is that there is no such thing as a view from nowhere. Where you are standing, your perspective, whether it's a, an argument that you had with your spouse or the way that you're treating your neighbor, or the way that you perceive your finances, or the way that you perceive your, your uh, situation as a citizen of Australia or America or wherever you live, every perspective that you have, every idea that you have is uniquely, idiosyncratically, and necessarily your own. You are standing there and seeing, and this is where we kind of play tricks on ourselves, we think that we're seeing the world totally objectively. This is why we say things like, how could they believe that? How could they possibly, how could she, how could they? When in reality, we see things from our own perspective, and I'm suggesting here, when it comes to the plan, the beautiful, believable plan of God, we tend to see things on a very terrestrial level. I am a sinner. I have failed. I have made mistakes. I have let people down. I have let myself down. I have let my church out. I have done poorly. 
I wrestle with guilt and shame and lust, and, and I need rescue. And we, we, we tend to sort of make the, the plan of salvation quite myopic and quite terrestrial. That at the end of the day, it's really just about getting you out of your own head. Now don't get me wrong, the plan, the beautiful, believable plan will get you out of your own head. But because it's going to be a byproduct of a much bigger thing that's happening. Something that's happening on a cosmic scale, on a universal scale, that affects what happens in your little world, but does not orbit around what happens in your little world. There is no view from nowhere. One of the centerpieces of scripture, one of the ideas that you have to get your mind around to understand the story that scripture is telling and the plan that God is launching is the idea that God is in some significant sense in conflict and on trial. God is on trial. God is on, what did I say everybody? God is on trial. C.S. Lewis, who we quoted just a moment ago, wrote a book to this effect titled God in the Dock. God in the dock. The dock is the place where in the British court system you stand when you're being cross-examined, when you're being questioned. God on trial. In one of the earlier presentations in this series, we gave a series of quotations from Habakkuk and the Psalms and Jeremiah where the writers of Scripture are saying to God, God, have you, have you let go of the steering wheel of the universe? God, have you lost your mind? Are you blind that you cannot see? Are you deaf that you cannot hear? Remember that text from Jeremiah, I think it was chapter 12, where Jeremiah says, God, if I took you to court, you would win. But still, where is your justice? So you have this, this, this motif that is absolutely saturated in the Bible that God is not only in conflict in some cosmic sense, but God is in some significant sense. His moral character and governance is on trial. Not just by agencies, supernatural, demonic agencies, but by human beings who say, God, where is your justice? There are many passages that could be cited, but I give you just a few of the best known here on the screen. I'll give you eight. In Genesis chapter 3, we, we open the very, the, the, very, the very story of Scripture, the narrative of Scripture opens against the backdrop of accusation and conflict. You'll be familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, of course, and Eve is there standing at the tree, and the serpent asks the question in a suggestive and subtle way, has God really said you shall not eat of every tree? Of course, God had said you can't eat of every tree except one, but the way the question is framed creates a situation in, a, in which it looks like God is actually has a vast horizon of limit and only a very small niche of freedom. When in fact God had given a vast horizon of freedom and only a very small window, a very small, a single tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the way that the question is asked suggests that God is withholding, that God is unreasonable. When the woman protests and says, no, 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 we can eat of other trees, but of that one tree we can't eat because if we eat of that tree we will die, the serpent, the enemy, immediately pushes back and says, you won't die. What we have here is a challenge or an accusation against the Word of God. God has made a statement, I've made a statement. Now we have conflict. Conflict, a conflict of ideas, a conflict of truth. God could, have, of course, come right down into the garden if he had so chose, snapped his finger, and there is no more serpent. There is no more resistance. There is no more rebellion. That's not what we're talking about here. A physical melee. No, 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 no. We have an actual conflict here. God says in the day you eat, you die. The serpent says you don't die. These things stand in opposition to one another, and the question is, how is it to be resolved? The, the, the serpent then says, let me tell you why God told you that you would die. God knows that in the day you eat of the tree, you'll be like God's, knowing good and evil. Let me translate that. God is not looking out for your best interest. God is looking out for his own best interest. God is not someone to be a friend of. God is someone to be afraid of. And so right at the heart of Scripture, when we open the Bible, we begin to, to understand this beautiful, believable plan. We don't even get to the, past the third chapter before we see that the God of this book, the God of Scripture, is embroiled in conflict, and there's a kind of trial going on. God is unreasonable. God is a withholder. God is unjust. God is unfair. God is self-serving. God is looking out for himself. We then go to a passage, Job, chapter, Job chapters 1 and 2. In fact, why don't you join me there? If you've got your Bible, go to the book of Job. This is another passage in which we find a conflict and a trial motif. Now, there are hundreds of these in the Bible, and I didn't misspeak there. There are hundreds of similar passages to this effect, okay? But uh, this idea of, of a trial or of a, of a conflict. But I'm just going to give you some of the best known. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Now there was a day 
when the sons of God, celestial beings of some description, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, the word Satan from the Hebrew Satan, just means the enemy or the adversary. The Satan, it's not a proper name like David is a proper name or Mark is a proper name or Elizabeth is a proper name. The Satan, the enemy, the withstander came and, said, and God says to him, from where do you come? So Satan answered and said to the Lord, from going to and fro on earth and from walking back and forth on it. This is a territorial claim. When the question is put, what are you doing here? You did not receive an invitation. He effectively says, no, no, I do belong here. I belong here. I've come from earth where I've been walking to and fro. This is a dog-like territorial claim, right? You, you put a, a mean dog on a chain and you, put, you chain him to a tree and that little, that, that circumference of that circle, that's his. God says, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? Who do you represent? I come from earth. Walking back and forth on it. God protests his territorial claim. God resists the territorial claim. Now, I just got, I got to point this out. God is having a conversation. He's having a conflict with a being, again, that he could snap his fingers and immediately would be gone. He could think this being out of existence. He could snap this being out of existence. He could kick the dirt and this being goes out of existence, which raises the question, why is God having a conversation, an actual legal conflict with one of his creatures? And the answer was actually found there in verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves. In other words, there are others looking on. This is not something that's happening between God and Satan in isolation. The two of them in a closed room, they're the only two beings in the universe, the only two beings in existence. No. In the same way that in the garden there was an implied audience listening in, an angelic audience and a divine audience listening in to the serpent's accusations, here there is an explicit audience. The sons of God have come and, and God says, what are you doing here? Oh, you know, just walking to and fro on my planet, laying here a territorial claim. God now resists the territorial claim of the, of the Satan. Verse 9, so Satan answered the, uh, excuse me, so God says, this is in verse 8, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Your territorial claim is not exhaustive. It's not complete. What about Job? Job doesn't follow your principles. He follows mine. Job is not represented by you. He's represented by me. The earth is not yours. Verse 9, so Satan answered. Watch this. The answer is, he answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? He basically says, are you kidding, old man? Are you kidding? You're going to use Job as an example. The only reason he's afraid of you, the only reason he worships you, the only reason he fears you is obvious. Verse 10, come on. And you can just imagine as the Satan begins to make whatever you see in your mind's eye, just let your imagination run wild here because we have no physical description of any of this. So just let your imagination run wild. But in your mind's eye, the Satan turns, as it were, to the jury, turns to the sons of God and says, come on, come on, come on. We all know the story of Job. The story goes like this, verse 10. Has not God made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Hasn't God blessed the work of his hands and the possessions, his possessions have increased in the land? But now watch this, he says to the sons of God and to God. Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. Clearly, this is a, oh, there's no denying this is a conflict. But it's not just a conflict. This is the key thing I want you to get here. It's a legal conflict. It's a conflict over God's governance and over God's character. Job worships. Job serves. Job is who he is because you've effectively bought him off with blessings. If he didn't have all of those blessings, if he didn't have all the accoutrements of your goodness to surround him, then he would curse you to your face. And here is where the rest of the book of Job just unloads, where God says, okay, we will test your hypothesis. We'll test your hypothesis. You can do, and then we'll get to this in just a bit. You can do certain things, other things you cannot do. So in these two passages, Genesis 3 and Job 1, of, among many others, we find that God is not only in a conflict, again, I can't emphasize this strongly enough, not a physical conflict, but a conflict of ideas and of character and of governance. Another well-known passage is in Zechariah 3. We won't go there, but here Satan stands in accusation against God's representative, Joshua the high priest. In Isaiah chapter 14, one of the best-known passages in the Old Testament describing this conflict and describing this, this, this uh, trial motif, 
uh, it, it, Satan, the, the, this uh, power says, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Translation, I can run the universe better than you. My principles are superior to your principles. In Matthew chapter 4, we see this, this fascinating little interplay where Jesus, incarnate Jesus now in the flesh, has been led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he's tempted on three accounts. If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. It says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted, which raises the question, why? And what we're going to see here is that for reasons that we don't fully understand, but which we somewhat understand, God is bound by certain terms of engagement. Terms of what did I say, everyone? Terms of engagement. That God just doesn't get to do willy-nilly whatever he wants. And there are robust philosophical and theological reasons for this. But the short version is, is that when God gave actual freedom to actual creatures to make actually morally significant decisions, God was in some significant sense limited to a covenantal engagement. He can't just go charging in like a bull in a china shop and say, I'm God, I get to do what I want, how I want. And no. What we find is, is that when Jesus becomes a man, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted. For some reason, Jesus, incarnate Jesus, fleshly Jesus, has to meet Satan on certain terms, a certain situation, and he's tempted. Cause these stones to be made bread. Cast yourself down from the temple. Bow down and worship me. And in every case where the conflict comes, on the forum or the field of engagement, Jesus resists the overtures of the enemy. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says this. Speaking to the religious leaders of his day, he says, you are of your father, the devil. And then he adds this. He was a murderer from the beginning and a liar. A murderer from the beginning and a liar. How, pray tell, can you have a murderer and a liar from the very beginning? Who did he murder? Who did he lie about? So this whole idea of murder and lie and of resistance is built into the very framework, the very fabric of Scripture. Creation, yes. Conflict, yes. And covenant. In Jude chapter 1, verse 9, there's this fascinating little verse in that, that penultimate book of the Bible that says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil about the body of Moses, did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. Fascinating. You get this, this little vignette, this tiny little picture where, where Michael has come down to resurrect the body of Moses and, and the Satan resists. He says, no, you don't have a right. Again, there's terms of engagement here. God can say, don't have a right and, and kick him and he's gone. But, but apparently it's as, if, it's as if Satan is saying, you're not playing fair. We have agreed upon rules of engagement in the same way that if you go play a game of basketball or a game of touch football, right? You have agreed upon terms of engagement. If you're playing touch, you don't full tackle. If you're playing basketball, you can't pick up the Bible, or the Bible, excuse me, the ball, and run with it, right? You can pick up the Bible and run with it as long as you're running to the front lines and not away from them. Okay, so, so the idea here is, is that once you engage, you have terms of engagement, you have, you have rules. And in, in all of these cases, we see that there's like some sort of a forum some sort of a situation in which God cannot just do what he wants, how he wants, when he wants, to who he wants. He has to engage in a way that is regarded as fair and equitable and in keeping with legality. It's not legal for you to raise Moses, he seems to be saying. And then in Revelation chapter 12, the accuser is cast out. I've got that verse here, Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. So the great dragon was cast out. And so John wants you to have no mistake about who we're describing here. The serpent of old. That's Genesis 3. That's the serpent in the tree talking to Eve. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, the accuser, the what? The accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Three times it says, He's been cast down, he's been cast down, he's been cast down. But what I want you to notice is what he's called. Satan, even when he's introduced to us, this enemy is introduced to us back in the book of Genesis, it says, now the serpent was more subtle. The serpent was more clever. The serpent was more cunning. The power of the enemy is not in the strength of his nature, it's in the deceitfulness, the nuance, and the subtlety of his words. Jesus said he's a liar. He's a liar from the beginning. He's telling lies. He told the woman lies. You're not going to really die. God is looking out for himself. And did God really say you can't eat of every tree? 
He told lies there in Job chapter 1 where they were standing before the sons of God and he said, if you do such and such, then he will curse you to your face. It's always subtle. There's nuance. There's innuendo. And here, as we get down to the very end, we, we've gone basically through the whole of Scripture there, at least in, in, in some of the mountaintops. We get down to Revelation chapter 12 and the good news is announced, the accuser, the accuser is cast down. He's cast down. He's cast down. Which raises a question, how? I mean, God could have, again, cast him down, and I can't make this point strongly enough. God could have just cast him down as, as easily as you and I take a drink of water, as easily as you and I take a step, as easily as you and I take a breath. So why this big to-do? Why this big announcement? Why this big praise session? He's cast down. He's cast down. He's cast down. If this is something that is easily resolved, because this, okay, here's a simple illustration just came to me right now. This conflict is not being sorted out in a boxing ring. It's being sorted out in a court of law. Think of it this way. Slanderous allegations, such as God is looking out for himself and Job would curse you if you didn't buy him off with blessings. Slanderous allegations cannot be effectively answered by a display of power or might. Does that make sense? Can you imagine somebody saying, he's a bad human being. He's a bad person. And he'd be like, no, I'm not. And if you say it again, I'll kick you. Beep. Right? That actually, that actually feeds into the basic nature of the accusation. It doesn't do anything to dispel the accusation. A conflict over character cannot be settled by power, but requires, what's the last word there? Demonstration. A conflict over character will require demonstration. Now, here, I mentioned earlier that there are hundreds of these covenantal references, these these, these trial references in both the Old and the New Testament. This is from Richard Davidson, one of the brightest minds, one of the brightest theological minds alive today, writing in an article for the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society, an article titled Divine Covenant Lawsuit. Look at what Dr. Davidson says here. The Divine Covenant Lawsuit, that's a, a lawsuit between God and His people, right? Between God and His creation, between God and His creatures. The Divine Covenant Lawsuit is pervasive in Scripture saturative in scripture as both a discrete subgenre and as a prominent motif throughout the various parts of the Old and New Testament. I have identified at least 320 different references to a divine covenant lawsuit in the Old Testament alone. Right? You find passages in scripture where the, the Bible will say things like this, God has a dispute with his people. God has a conflict with his people. You, you have these references to a legal setting to a legal motif, that there's a lawsuit that's at hand here, okay? Notice this from Keith Van Hooser, Kevin Van Hooser, excuse me, faith speaking understanding. The great theater of the world, he says, turns out to be a courtroom. It looks like a war zone, but it's actually a courtroom in which defendants and prosecutors plead their respective cases and witnesses give testimony. We're going to return to that witness idea in just a second. But this idea of a courtroom, this idea of a theater, brings about 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, where the Apostle Paul, almost as an aside, just a little, a little statement that he mentions almost offhandedly says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle. And the Greek word there I've put in, in brackets for you to see, the Greek word there is a theatron. We have been made a spectacle, a theatron to the world. Now look at what he says. To angels and men. We, he says, the apostles, the, the, as we travel from town to town, as we experience what we experience, whether it's miracles or persecution, he says, it's, people are watching. And not just other human beings, but he says, angels are watching. It's like a movie theater, like a court of law in which evidence is being presented and arguments are being marshaled. The Van Hooser quotation continues. What is finally on trial, he says, in the covenantal courtroom drama of the Christ is the truth about the nature of God's reign and the identity of the king. That is, what is being tried is God's covenantal faithfulness, the very righteousness of God. The question is not, is God powerful enough to run the universe? The question is, is does he deserve to run the universe? That's the question at hand. Does he deserve to? And in the context of this legal setting, there are arguments being marshaled both for and against God's governance. God's enemy, Satan, has been given a set time and place to demonstrate his opposition to God. And this is a key idea that you need to get in your mind. 
In every case where we see this again and again in Scripture, where Satan is given room to work, where the enemy is given to room, room to work, it's always within well-defined parameters, set times, set places, right? Even God said in that situation with Job, you can do this, but not this, right? It's like saying in basketball, you can dribble the ball with one hand, but you can't touch it with two and then dribble again. That's called double dribble. So there's certain things you can do, but there's certain things you can't do. There's parameters here. There's rules of engagement. Evil's limits are found again and again. Think about Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was confined to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As sparse as the account is, it seems pretty clear that the serpent couldn't just go wandering around wherever he wanted. He could meet with them at a place, at a certain place. And even though the text doesn't say it, I think implied in the narrative is only for a certain time. He wasn't going to be able to indefinitely bother them. There was a test. There was a probationary period. Job chapter 1 to 2, as we've just mentioned here, there were specific limitations on the temptation, specific limitations. One of the best known passages uh, in the book of Daniel that describes the, the, the marauding power of this little horn, this antichrist power, it says it blasphemes and it persecutes, but then it's very clear, only for 1260 days. Yes, it can wage its war, and yes, it can speak its blasphemous words, but within a set time and space. Here and not here. So God gives limits. In Matthew chapter 13, you might remember this story. This is one of the great stories where, where Jesus said that the, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And then, and then as the seeds began to come up, the, the laborers noticed that there were not only wheat, but there were weeds or tares among the wheat. And so they went to the landowner and they said, hey, do you want us to go gather up the, the, the bad stuff? And Jesus said, no, let both grow together, not indefinitely, not interminably, let them grow together until the harvest. There is a set parameter, a set situation, a set time, a set scope in which evil can have reign. And then Revelation chapter 12, we mentioned this just a moment ago, the accuser is cast down. And when he's cast down, it says he's cast to earth where he is given a short time. It says that he's fiercely angry because he knows he has just a short time. And so we always see in God's interface with evil, this is the thing we've got to be careful of. God is never at the mercy of evil where it's like, oh no, evil has me in a stranglehold now. Maybe I won't prevail. Maybe I won't win. No. What God is doing is he's dealing with evil on evil's terms at every space, quarantining it in legally appropriate ways. Right? Now again, you and I, we're like the, the, the little ant that's crawling through the grass, right? We're totally unaware of the, you know, the, the sun and the solar system and the, the, the great discoveries of the Hubble telescope. We don't know any of that. What we know is, is I've got to crawl through this grass. We see, see things from this perspective. What I'm suggesting to you here is this, this court motif, this cosmic motif is the thing that eventuates in, results in your salvation. But the big point is not primarily to save you. That is a a glorious point, and I'm quite thrilled about it, to be honest. I'm really looking forward to all of this. But, but there's something else that's happening. And the other thing that's happening is that God's rule, God's character, God's moral governance is being vindicated. And your personal salvation, your personal victory over guilt and shame and sin is a byproduct of the bigger thing that's happening on the cosmic scale. Let me continue to walk you through this. John C. Peckham in a book, a forthcoming book, it's not released until September, but I was lucky enough, blessed enough to reach out to John and have him send me an advanced copy. And I tell you, the book, I just can't stop reading it. The book is titled Theodicy of Love. And I was just re reading back through it again this morning. Six chapters, 80,000 words, absolutely phenomenal. And in the book, Peckham says, in fact, I told him this morning, I said, John, I'm quoting you in the sermon. Is it okay if I quote you from a book that doesn't come out until September? He said, have at it. Just tell them the book is coming out and where to get it. You can get it from Amazon. <laughs> At the level of sheer power, no one could oppose an omnipotent being. Say amen if that makes sense. Yeah, sheer, sheer power, you can't resist an omnipotent being. As such, says Peckham, any conflict between the omnipotent God and others could not be one of sheer power, but of, and I've underlined this for you here, of a different kind. Not a boxing ring, but a courtroom. What then is the nature of the conflict, Peckham asks? Scripture depicts the conflict as a dispute over God's moral character and government. Cosmic allegations have been raised before the heavenly council, not just in Job, but again, remember Davidson. There are 300 covenant lawsuit motifs 
in the Old Testament alone. There's many in the New Testament as well. Cosmic allegations have been raised before the Heavenly Council claiming that God is not wholly good, loving, or just. This is then largely an epistemic conflict or a belief conflict, a knowledge conflict, which cannot be won by the mere exercise of power, but is met by an extended demonstration of character in a cosmic courtroom drama. What kind of a drama? A courtroom. So within these limits, whether it's stuck to a tree or specific limits in Job for a 1260 day period or only until the harvest or only to the earth, and there are other passages that could be marshaled, the response of God in every one of these instances is Jesus' response to Matthew chapter 13. When the laborers came and saw the wheat and the tares, they went back to the landowner and said, didn't you sow good seed in your field? And, and the response was unequivocal from the landowner. An enemy has done this. Where did the tares come from? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy has done this. Let me translate that for you. That means that Jesus, the landowner in the parable, symbolized, symbolized of, uh, symbol of Jesus, took zero responsibility for the appearance of the weeds. He didn't say, well, you know, I stuck in a few bad with the good and I didn't think you guys would notice. No, he was emphatic. An enemy has done this. So what we're dealing with here is, is God fit to rule? Is God should he be allowed to rule? Does he deserve to rule? Again, it's not a question of strength. We've established that again and again. Richard Bauckham in his book, The Theology of Revelation, the book of Revelation says, the world is a kind of courtroom, see this again and again, in which the issue of who is the true God is being decided. In this judicial contest, Jesus and his followers bear witness to the truth. What do we do? We bear Witness. Now that's why we talk about Christians witnessing. That's what the, the term, when we say, I witness for Jesus, it's, it's not just telling somebody that, that they can accept Jesus as their personal savior. To be a witness, imagine yourself in a courtroom testifying. That's why we say Christians should testify. Testify, brother. Because you are in a courtroom and you are saying, I have tested God's rule. I have tested God's reign. I have tested God's sovereignty in my life in my house, in my sexuality, in my checkbook. I have tested God's governance and he's good. Amen. You are testifying. You are a witness in a trial. Many of us have used these terms, testify and witness, and weren't even really quite sure what we were saying. No, you're a witness. You're, you have something to say. If God has been good to you, if he's come through for you, if he's, if he's delivered you in a tight spot, if he's answered a prayer, if you have found in him a peace that passes understanding and a security that could not come from the, 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 the ways of this world, then you can testify and say, I can say God is good. You can testify. You become now not just an observer. You become a participant and even the very stakes of the drama. Now, what's one of the cool things? This just came to me this week. Revelation, you get down to the last book of the Bible, you go through all of this courtroom drama, hundreds of instances of covenant lawsuit and God in conflict and God on trial, and you get down to the book of Revelation, the last book. And you have about six or seven, depending on how you count them, well-defined court scenes, throne room scenes, where God is in, in, the, in the throne room, where God is in court, so to speak. And a fascinating thing, Revelation has many court scenes, but in none of them is the accuser present. He was present in Job. He was present in, in, Gen present in Genesis 3. He was present in Zechariah. There are places where he does show up in the courtroom to make an accusation, to make an objection. But when you get to Revelation, the accuser's not there anymore. Why would that be? Well, it's a simple matter of chronology. The book of Revelation was written after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave. Jesus died and rose from the grave at the end of about AD 31. The book of Revelation is written at about AD 95, AD 96. And so the reason that you don't see when John saw in vision the heavenly courtroom, that battle had been won. That battle had been won, so he doesn't show up. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The accuser of our brethren who accused him before our God day and night has been cast down. I look, this is great, one of, the, one of the, the, in my view, the quintessential courtroom scene, the quintessential throne room scene, pardon me, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a, stood a lamb as if it had been slain. So John sees there the very throne room of God and when he sees the throne, he sees in symbolic 
uh, imagery. I don't know how this works exactly in prophetic vision. We can ask John when we get there. But John says he saw on the throne a lamb, and not just any lamb, a slain lamb. Now, don't miss this. This is key. Richard Bauckham in his book, The Theology of Revelation, says, watch this point and watch it carefully. When the slain lamb, the slaughtered lamb, is seen in the midst of the divine throne in heaven, well, that's the verse we just read a moment ago, the meaning is that, and I've underlined this for you, do not miss this. Bauckham says what that means then is that Christ's sacrificial death belongs to the way God rules the world. On the throne is vulnerability. On the throne is apparent weakness. On the throne is a God who reigns not by the strength of his nature, but by the humility and the condescension and the goodness of his character. Bauckham says the only thing that can mean is that that's how God rules. God rules from a position of humility. He rules from a position of weakness. He rules from a position of woundedness. Sigve Tonstad in his amazing commentary on the book of Revelation, Saving God's Reputation, says, in Revelation, God's leading adversary, the enemy, the Satan, is called the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. He's said to be the deceiver of the whole world. He's said to be the what of the whole world? Now watch what Tonstad does with this. The deceiver. This disclosure, what disclosure, Dr. Tonstad? Well, the fact that he's a deceiver. This disclosure that his primary MO, his primary effective strategy is that he's deceiving, he's nuanced, he's subtle, he's clever, there's a legal courtroom drama. This disclosure explains why the antagonist in the conflict cannot be brought to heal by what? Force. The deceiver must be unmasked. And the task of doing that, says Tonstad, in the book of Revelation has been accomplished by who? Who accomplished it? Jesus in the form of a slain lamb. I love this idea. The enemy, cannot, the enemy cannot be merely physically or militarily defeated. He would have to be exposed. His arguments would have to be shown to be faulty. His claims would have to be shown to be without evidence and without basis. Now what you and I, this is my point here, what you and I perceive as the plan of salvation, which by the way, that's, that's, I'm not suggesting that's not true. It is true. Part of the plan, a big part of the plan, was to save you and I. I'm not suggesting that, I'm not diminishing that in any way. I'm simply saying that that's the perspective of the ant crawling through the grass. There's another thing that's happening up here. What you and I perceive and receive as salvation is but a revelation and demonstration of who God actually is. When God reigns as he reigns and he rules as he rules and he is who he is, people like you get saved because God is just the kind of God that would rather hang on a cross at your expense than do away with you in some other way because it was convenient. Now, friends, what we're dealing with here is a revelation of God's character, a demonstration of who he is. This was the very point that Van Hooser made. I give this quotation again. Just look at the last line. What is being tried is the covenant faithfulness of God, the righteousness of God. The Apostle Paul, speaking of the righteousness of God, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Because in the gospel, follow this, in the gospel, in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is what? What's the word? Is revealed. Now, this is an illustration I've used before, and you might have seen me do it, but I'm going to do it for you here again. If I hide my right hand behind this book, you cannot see it, right? If I put my hand behind this book, you cannot see it, right? Can you see my right hand? You can, okay? So now watch this. Can you see it now? You want to see that again? I'm not kidding. I can do that. I can do that. Now. You think that Pastor Ashrick has lost his mind, okay? Let me explain what's happening here. My hand is there. The removing of the book does not create my hand. What, what, what does it do? What word am I going to say here? The moving of the book reveals what was there all along. It reveals what, what's already there. You see, friends, when God hung on a cross, he didn't in some manufactured or contrived way create a reality that was different to his basic nature and character. When there was a person in need, 
God's essential nature, the fiber and fabric of what makes God God was, the, the cross was already tattooed on the heart of God before there was ever a need. And when there came to be a need, there was a cross. Another way to say this is the moment there was a sinner, there was a savior. Because God doesn't have to manufacture, he doesn't have to work up the gumption to behave in this way. Greater love has no man than this, and a man would lay down his life for his friends. God didn't have to say, okay, I can do it. Like, this is who he is. This is who he is. And so what's on trial is not just God's actions, but who is God? What kind of a being is he? We put this up on the screen a few days ago. Epicurus, the Greek philosopher of the third century, he said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then where does evil come from? Is he neither able nor willing? Then what do you call him God for? The problem here is that Epicurus misunderstood the nature of freedom, evil, omnipotence, God, and basically everything. Okay? Because this is what he doesn't understand. God is destroying evil right now in your life and in my life, in your heart and in my heart, in your affections and in my affections. God is destroying evil by destroying its attractiveness and its allure. He is unmasking evil. He is unmasking selfishness. He is letting both grow together until the harvest. I love this point. God is unmasking evil by letting it run its terrible course. And then these two words, over him. Not just to run its terrible course over you, but to run the terrible course over him. If you don't believe me, look at this. In, in one of the great prophetic visions of the suffering Messiah, we have these words. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. We like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He didn't open his mouth. He was led as a, he was led as a, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. What was seated on the throne in the Revelation vision in Revelation 5? What was seated on the throne? A slain lamb. Because that's the way that God is. It's how he rules. He didn't meet violence with greater violence. He didn't meet force with greater force. It would have taken no great show of force on the part of God. It would have taken no great show, uh, show of violence on the part of God. He could have snapped his fingers and solved the conflict militarily, <coughs> physically. Nah. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. He poured out his soul. His soul, his very essence, his very being. This is when Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death, he said when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He poured out his soul. He was numbered with the sinners, numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. You, friend, you see, friends, this is amazing. God has won the most important victory in the most unlikely way. He was his strongest and his most attractive and his most powerful and his most sublime when he was nailed to a cross, a Roman cross. When it looked like he had lost everything and been summarily defeated, he won. And this is the point that Paul makes in Colossians 2.15. He disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Friends, in the ancient world, if you got nailed to a cross, you didn't win anything except the unlucky lottery. You won nothing. You're naked and, and bruised and nailed to a piece of wood. You've lost everything. You've lost your dignity. You've lost your life. You've, you've lost uh, your health. You, you, you're in great pain. You've, you've won nothing. And yet the, 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 the theme of Scripture is this idea that God has immersed himself in a drama where he says, I won't meet force with force, might with might, power with power. I will, violence with violence, I will become subject to force. I will become subject to violence. I will become subject to power. I will show you there is a power greater than violence. There's a power greater than force. It's called humility, it's called service, and it's called self-sacrificial love. And God, as it were, in the courtroom says, this is who I am. Do you want me as king or not? And friends, those that stand on the sea of glass and that live with God in eternity will say, behold, this is our king and our God, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is worthy to receive worship, not because he's so darn strong, but because he's so totally beautiful. You see, friends, the beautiful, believable plan is that God said, I'll show them who I am. I'll reveal who I am. 
And they can then decide, and Jesus said it this way, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw, not drive, I will draw all peoples to myself. Today, friends, God is drawing you to himself. Not by the strength of his nature. Yes, he is God, and yes, he is sovereign, and yes, he deserves to be worshipped, and he is powerful and all of that. But God wants to be loved. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be appreciated. God longs for an actual, genuine relationship of trust and of intimacy and of friendship from you. He doesn't just want you to be afraid of being lost, being afraid of not making it, being afraid of what will happen to you if you don't tow the line. That's not God. God says, this is who I am. I am a lamb slain, seated on the throne. Who wants me as king? Pilate said to him, you are a king. And Jesus said, you tell the truth. You tell the truth. It is for this purpose that I came into the world. But let me tell you this, Pilate. My servants won't fight. My servants aren't going to, to fight. Because my kingdom is a different kind of kingdom. My kingdom is not Rome. It's bigger, better, and more powerful than Rome. This is a kingdom that transcends national boundaries and military boundaries. It's a kingdom of love where God invites us to love him, to appreciate him, to serve him, and to serve his children because of how beautiful he is. How beautiful the name of Jesus. What a wonderful, beautiful name. Amen. Who here today wants to say, you know what, that's a king I can serve. That is a king that I can serve. I can serve that kind of a king. Father in heaven, we respond to you today in worship. Father, the worship of the mind and the worship of the heart. We respond today and say, this is a king that we feel totally, not just comfortable with, but totally in love with. A king that we can yield ourselves to completely. A God that we can not be afraid of, not running from, but running to. Father, help us to tell this beautiful, believable plan to those around us. That the goodness of God is on display. Help us, Father, to witness and to testify in this grand courtroom drama that is the theater of grace, the theater of the world. Help us to testify to your goodness is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let all of God's citizens and subjects and sons and daughters say,